Support for this NPR podcast and the following message come from UCSF Medical Center. UCSF Medical Center is ranked the number one hospital in California by U.S. News and World Report. UCSF Health, redefining possible. Check out Mogul, the new series from Gimlet Media and the Loudspeakers Network. The series tells the story of hip-hop legend Chris Lighty. Chris Lighty managed stars like LL Cool J, 50 Cent, and Busta Rhymes. It's a story about the birth of hip-hop and the birth of a hip-hop legend. But it's also about the darkest side of the industry and a lot of stuff that people would rather not talk about. Listen to Mogul now on Apple Podcasts or wherever you like to listen. I was wearing out the infamous. I was wearing that album out. Um, By Mob Deep. Mob Deep. Yeah. Oh, my God. You're making I was references that, that not, not all of our Ow. NPR listeners are aware <laughs> Got you. of. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. I'm thinking I'm on like a late night hip hop show. I'm just I'm just dropping <laughs> into that mode with you guys. I'm sorry. I apologize. We're, we're trying to expand our horizons here. <laughs> yes. Okay, Mob Deep. Got you. Sophomore got you. effort. We're all, the infamous. We're all, we're all, there you go. Yo, 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 yo. Hey, everybody. This is Stretch Armstrong. And my name is Bobby Tukasi, a.k.a. Cool Bob Love. That was Oscar-winning actor Mahershala Ali, one of the hottest actors around. He's our guest today on What's Good with Stretch and Bobbito. Your source for untold stories and uncovered truths from movers and shakers around the world. Mahershala was also a hip-hop artist who put out a record in 2007 on Oakland's influential Hieroglyphics Emporium label. And there may be more rap in his future, but first... We're going to talk to my boy, my homie, my brother from another mother, DJ Stretch Armstrong. (laughs) Stretch, we're going to ask Mahershala how music helps him prep for acting, which got me wondering, when you DJ, what do you listen to while you're getting your set together? You're asking me what music I play before I DJ? Yes. I don't. You don't? No. Yo, I'm always in a rush. (laughs) I'm I'm like rushing to get home to grab my computer. How about you, Bob? I feel like I try to. You try to catch a vibe before you go out. Yeah, I try to. Well, I mean, see, the thing is, at the crib, I'm not gonna play it loud. Mm -hmm. Whereas when we're playing in clubs around the world, with you know these ten thousand dollar sound systems, it's just you hear different things. You hear the cymbal, you hear the hi hat, you hear the the percussion, you hear all these things. Absolutely, I remember I I had a gig. It was a really memorable gig. It was uh, after nine eleven, and the Beastie Boys organized a benefit. It was kind of pushing back against the vilification of Islam and Muslims after 9-11. And there were two nights at the Hammerstein Ballroom. And it was like Moby, Beastie Boys, um, Tom Tom Club, I think, Talking Heads, Blondie. um, And I was the DJ for the event. Wow. And they put me in one of those balconies, you know, overlooking the stage. Like the old powerhouse club. And I said, what am I going to play? You know, this this was still 2001. So I was still really coming out of like heavy hip hop period right but i didn't feel like that music was appropriate for a solemn event like this which was really a a time for people to really look inward and so i said i'm going to play positive music that i would listen to at home and in relation to what you just said about sound systems i was cutting up like just really feel good music that we collectively grew up on and to hear i I remember at one point I, i was cutting up doubles of the word by the beatles And hearing that on that sound system, I've never heard the Beatles like that before. You know, obviously I never saw the Beatles in concert, not old enough, but to hear that music on that system, I mean, it was like going to church. I'm not a religious person, but certainly spiritual. That was as spiritual a moment for me as I think I've ever had. Goosebumps. Nice. That's beautiful, Stretch. Coming up next, we are gonna hear how Mahershala Ali prepares for some of his roles by hearing music that inspires him. We'd like to say a quick thank you and share a message from one of our sponsors, Stoke Cold Brew Coffee. At Stoke, they recognize that not every bean measures up. Stoke is steeped at cool temperatures for at least 10 hours to achieve a smooth taste. It's slow brewed like all the best ideas. Stoke Cold Brew Coffee. Look at you go. And we're back. Joining us now is Mahershala Ali. Ali is an actor at the top of his game. No, 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 don't talk yet. (laughs) Oh, my bad, my bad, Just chill, my bad. just chill. We're going to get see, to you. You see, I, I, don't, I don't do this enough. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to get to you. Just chill. Ali is an all actor right, at the top right. of his game. He made his film debut in The Curious Case of Benjamin Button. 
He's been in hit Netflix dramas House of Cards and Luke Cage. And recently he co-starred two Oscar-nominated films, Hidden Figures and Moonlight. Moonlight won Best Picture and earned Mahershala the award for Best Supporting Actor. Indeed. Mahershala, welcome to the show. I can talk now. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Are you good? <laughs> <laughs> you got the double thumbs up. Peace. Peace. How you guys doing? Great, great, great. Great to have you here. How's it going? Thank you. Great being here, man. Really, truly an honor, man. Thank you. Well, we just covered your acting cred, and everyone knows you mm. as an actor, but what they might not know yeah. is that mm. you were an MC who dropped an yeah. album under the moniker Prince Ali via our mm -hmm. boys Hieroglyphics through the Hiro Emporium. Yeah. Hiro! Crystal light silhouettes slipping into something fresh. Keep the blocks popping over red and baka pockets. California poppy soccer flower picking problems. Talking something out of salt and summer swoon sauce. Them. Slowing up, growing up, throwing up. Do you still write rhymes? Yeah. And is there a part two to your career as an MC? That's really interesting. You would ask me that. Because <laughs> um, right now I am... Um, He's like, yo, I got 16 balls right now. <laughs> yeah, yo, yo, drop a beat. Um, right now, um, right now, I'm I'm writing a project that is essentially a marriage of the two um, about an MC, and I don't want to share too much about it right now. But um, I'm writing an album for the project that exists within the project itself. So um, yeah, it's a it's a film with a very very present hip hop element to it, but hopefully God willing a form of hip hop that hasn't really been properly addressed. I don't feel like in, in film and in like an in indie film, like we always see the, you know, the M and M's of the world who is, you know, obviously have their place and is an extraordinary MC, but then there's all those artists that the heads really grew up on, who is the blue collar MC, the one who flies under the radar, the one who is, is not going to be, in any capacity necessarily a millionaire per se you know what i mean yeah, uh, yeah, yeah but somebody who this is their life like the the hyro cats what's the entry point for you a hyro because i mean their time is the early mid 90s they're bubbling right. i'm sure you're writing back then but you don't come out mm -hmm. until 2007 so it's like it's parallel to your acting mm -hmm. career where like you're like mm -hmm. a little bit late you know it's it's and it's it's really in alignment with my personality. I was always kind of a dude who was on the scene but really kind of the wallflower. Like I was at their shows. I mm. I was you know, I remember playing my demo for Dell. Dell is Dell the Funky Homo Sapien, the first artist out of the Hieroglyphics crew. Yeah. And so I got signed and um we pressed up like uh 200 copies of of vinyl. And I got into grad school like two weeks later and I was like, I got to go do this grad school thing. So then I went to New York and I stopped recording for a while. And so that's why I didn't have anything come out until like 2007, because I was focusing on acting. So I want to we're going to make a turn here, because one thing that I'm particularly interested in, because I'm a ball player, is that. Mm hmm. You played... I've seen them handles. You got handles, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Man. Thank you. Thank you. Man. Um, is that you You played Division One basketball. I read that you, because of the limitations in creativity, that you decided to, to make a move away from sports. However, I'm going to challenge you because I'm curious. Yeah. You grew up in the Bay Area in the mm -hmm. 90s at a time when... Gary Payton, who was a future Hall of Famer, was redefining the idea of a creative defensive guard. And then on the playground, you had Demetrius Hook Mitchell at Mosswood playground. Jumping over cars. Jumping over cars, redefining what a <laughs> five foot eight, five foot nine person could do. So there's all this creativity in your cipher. And you I got, played against Steve Nash for four years at, at, uh, at Santa Clara when too. he was at University of Santa Clara. Yeah, so so yeah, I'm thinking yeah. like, what went wrong that that light turned off? You were like, you know what? I'm gonna dead this. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, Thank you. We try. You, do, you, do you have kids? You have kids, Bobby? Though, do you have kids? You I have, have children? A, I have a child who's now three years old at age fifty. I'm, okay, I'm, I'm grandpa age with a with a, with a toddler. <laughs> okay, you know we look. So many of us come from communities where we don't have fathers really present. You know, like in our lives every day. So I think sometimes, especially as I'm gonna speak for myself and being, you know, when I was coming up being a young African-American boy, you start to put a certain pressure on your environment to, to guide you. Right. And if you come out of high school 
and you step into the business of college athletics, thinking that it's the same thing that you were doing when you played junior high ball in high school, mm -hmm. you're going to get knocked on your behind. I was just shocked by how how much of a business it was, how you, how you felt like product. You know, mm -hmm. I played all four years, mm -hmm. but I essentially quit, I think, uh, because I lost my relationship with my coach. It didn't feel like, and most of us felt this way, it didn't feel like they cared about us as people. I saw people essentially get discarded. So they recruit you, they woo you, and if you don't sort of come as a finished product, then you kind of can get pushed to the side and they're just recruiting somebody else. They're not really focusing on developing the whole person. And, you know, I think if I had, if I had a different type of mentorship in my life, I probably would have handled that different, but I value those lessons because I still apply those things to my life and want to take personal responsibility for my experience. I, I just want to respond to that. Yeah. Because yeah. being an advocate of outdoor basketball and having played ball my whole life, college basketball, it wasn't a favorable experience for me myself. Hmm. It, it is a finite experience. The beauty of pickup mm. basketball, outdoor basketball, is that it's infinite, right? You can play ball when you're mm. eight years old. You can play ball when you're 80 years old. And mm. I hope that perhaps me, me and you cross paths at some point. So you could cross me over? <laughs> Stretch a set of picks for me and I'll drain and, and your eyepiece. I was say, I'll be the referee. <laughs> I, I, gar I guarantee you, brother, right now you would. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like to see that. So what's crazy, I suppose it's not surprising, but it's still really bugged out. You're the first ever Muslim actor to win an Academy Award. And I'm just curious, yeah. how does being a Muslim inform your work as an actor? Well, I think being a Muslim just informs my life in that I just am I'm really conscious that I'm a work in progress and that I have so many faults and things that I'm working to improve on. So when you look at these characters who you become responsible to advocate for in some capacity, that it makes me have more empathy for their circumstances. So it's very easy to look at somebody who's walking down the street who obviously may have a drug problem or someone who may in some way participate in domestic violence or be anything that we can easily point out and, and be judgmental of and probably be right as a, a result of it. But when you step into the shoes of that person, you got to be able to do the math on why they behave the way they do and what it is that they're struggling with and what what are the circumstances, be it externally or internally, that create some of the things that they're experiencing. So I think what Islam has done for me mostly is make me aware of of my own shortcomings. And I know that I'm responsible to improve upon those things. So that work will never stop. At the end of the day, we're all spirits having a physical experience and so when I look at those characters, I have to connect to that person's spirit and go, OK, in this physical experience, what is this person being educated about? What are they working to? How are they trying to improve? And that that really comes from my relationship with Islam, because it just makes me really conscious of my actions. In the realm of people of color in the United States, we face an issue where it's not always a true meritocracy. Um, mm -hmm. We graduate from college. Some of us get, get graduate degrees and I've seen it in my neighborhood growing up uptown where, you know, brothers and sisters still get wind up in the same job or same frame mm -hmm. that they could have most likely gotten had they not went to school and, and gotten into debt and everything. So it's tough. And mm -hmm. in the same vein, like in acting, someone can win an Academy Award mm -hmm. and feel at the top of their game, but still struggle to find the leading parts, the leading parts. Yeah. Right. So. You know, is mm -hmm. there a shift? Can is we there... not jinx this situation here? No, no. <laughs> Please? I mean, why are you even uttering those words? No, no, no. But, but, but I'm saying, but... I'm but getting to, nervous. No, no, but to open up... He's going to blame us. Is there a shift... <laughs> no. <laughs> is there a shift or an increase into roles that are being offered to actors of color? And are there roles that are coming on your radar um i i think that there's more content right now like if you look at we're kind of i guess in this golden age of television if you add streaming to that and i think there's more pressure on the powers that be to produce content that is more reflective of the world that we live in you know and how diverse the world is that we live in i think it is 
it's slowly changing. For me personally, I have seen a shift in, in the opportunities, um, but it's still a fight. There was a project that I wanted to move up and, and, you know, I was like maybe like third in it and I wanted to kind of be, uh, there was a, a little bit of an opening and I wanted to be considered for the top part post Oscar, you know, and it was like, eh, but hopefully, you know, we'll coming out of this, out of the Oscar, that this window will, will give me an opportunity to finally do some of the things that I've wanted to do for a really long time because, you know, I spent many, many years being the man next to the man next to the man and, that has a shelf life, man. That gets that gets old. Have there ever been any roles that were offered to you that that really offended you? Um, I think some of the experiences that have offended me have more to do with, and this is kind of like the undertow or like more like a camouflage version of racism or seeing people in a very limited way. Like I, I remember there's a part that I was up for, and I spoke to the director and. I'm talking to him for like 10, 15 minutes and he looks at me and he goes, um, yeah, I think you're just too nice for the part. I was like, huh? And he goes, yeah, you know, this guy's got to be like, you know, like a little, you know, grimy or whatever. And, and uh, so basically he needs the real thing, right? He needs a street dude. And I said, um, well, you know, I, I would like to look at myself as a transformational actor. So I'm ground zero. I am who I am. But you got to build from that and create the character. So there's a sense with at least with black people that and that's why you would see so many, so many MCs easily shift into acting because trained actors couldn't get hired. So they'll look at Robert De Niro or Leonardo DiCaprio or whomever, obviously extraordinary actors and go, oh, we want you to play this mobster from so-and-so, and and you're going to be in Boston, and they'll get an accent, they'll pick up weight or lose weight, dye their (laughs) hair, put some, Brian Gosling, put tattoos on his face for Place Beyond the Pines or whatever, and, like, you're looking at them, and they've transformed. But with the brother, they go, nah, we got to get 50 Cent for this. And it's offensive. So often you would see people from, from the music world who are viewed as being former thugs get placed into parts that are already written in a limited way and who see people of color in a very limited way, but they're viewed as being the real thing and get plugged in when they don't value those people as characters. Nah, it, it props because even your pacing, like you're portraying a cat from Harlem and Luke Cage, and I'm like, mm. even the way you space out your sentences at times, I'm like, he must have spent time in Harlem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my dad was um my dad had a place in Washington Heights and like at a very early age I'd be like I you know I was like 12 13 or something and I and I would be early for me and I'd say yo let's go to Harlem and he'd be like here's some money get some tokens and go to Harlem and I'd be like <laughs> okay and I'm like from the bay so I don't really know how to get around like that like yeah. I'm not in New York year round so I had to hop on the A train and go down 125th or whatever, and I would be walking around Harlem. And then I started going all the way down to the village, and I'd be walking around NYU area. And, like, it was like Candyland to me. It was just all so new, and there's so much noise. And people, you know, you got on subways back then, and, like, people were, like, they still do it a little bit, but, like, people were breakdancing. You hop off the thing, and, like, it's all the culture and the way people talked and the music. So I was just taking it all in, and then... You know, imitation is what the highest form of flattery in some way. So you're just looking at it and absorb it and imitate, but embody certain things. And that's how uh, um, acting has really served me. And, you know, and early on, I wanted to be a poet, like <laughs> back in back in the day with the whole like poetry slam scene and whatnot. So and just writing and having that kind of mind that likes to observe and write stuff down or like comment on it in some way it means that you got to watch and pay attention. So I think it's all kind of served me in that way. So um, I want to talk about upcoming roles. Do you consider the greater social or cultural impact of the roles that you might get? I've never had the luxury to really be able to think about what impression I was making. I just wanted a job, you know, and, and was looking at parts that I could, well, can I do something with that part? Like, how do I move up where I actually have some power and influence to to be able to say this is what I want to do and that's taken quite a bit of time to even get to that point but the main thing for me is to always even if I am 
playing somebody who is we could all agree on, like, you know, cotton mouth throwing somebody off of a roof is probably not an OK thing to do, that I have to make sure that that person has humanity still, though, that there's still like an internal struggle. Look, if you were going to produce the story of Moses, Moses is only good as Pharaoh. So the larger point of the story is still being made, you know, through the character of Moses, through the protagonist. But you need the antagonist to be great, too. It's just about being able to say, do I want to play Moses or do I want to play Pharaoh? And having that getting to that point where you get to choose is a hard place to get to. Um, real quick, I'll tell you, I, in the, we have this is Roxanne Roxanne biopic coming out. The character I play in that like has little to no redeeming qualities in it. And <laughs> it like and so it was it was the toughest role of my life. Like I literally had nightmares the last week working on it because he's he's really physically violent. I couldn't sleep. I felt horrible. It, was, it, it felt toxic. But to tell the hero's journey, you got to sign up to play the devil, you know, and I just don't want to do that too many times mm. um, to make a short story long, which I'm great at. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just rough. just be a little long with you. <laughs> no, 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 no. We, yeah. we look forward to seeing Roxanne, Roxanne. Listen, you alluded to music and some of the characters you played already. And this is interesting to us as DJs. We hear you make Spotify playlists for the characters that you play. I'm um, just curious yeah. if you could walk us through that process. I mean, hmm. Juan, who you play in Moonlight, he's an Afro-Cuban yeah. brother from down south. Yeah. You know, you sit down to make Juan's playlist. Like, how do you approach that? You know, I, I got really conscious of, of, like, how you were affected by sound. Like, my first introduction to that was, I remember I was probably, like, 10 years old, and um, I'd had the radio on. I just started turning the music on at night to go to sleep to, and my mom walked in, and she was like, yo, you can't you, you, you turn the radio off. And I was like, why? She goes, because, you know, you don't know what you're taking in. That affects you. And I was like, oh, all right, whatever. So I had to turn the radio off. Many years later, I remember I was wearing out the infamous. I was wearing that album out. Um, By Mob Deep. Mob Deep. Yeah. Oh, my God. You're making I was references that, that not, not all of our NPR out. listeners are aware <laughs> of. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's okay. I'm thinking I'm on like a late night hip hop show. I'm just, I'm just dropping into that mode with you guys. I'm sorry. I apologize. We're, we're trying to expand but our horizons so, here. Mob Deep's sophomore effort, we're all, the infamous. We're all, we're all, there you go. <laughs> um, so I remember listening to that album and I was wearing it out. And what I started to notice was I would feel darker after I had listened to it for a while. And so then I became real conscious of vibe. So then if you put on a tribe called Quest, a group from the golden era who just really, you know, we got to give your <laughs> listeners the whole. <laughs> I think, wait, I think the NPR yes. audience might know who tribe yeah. is. They might know in who a tribe way is. That they, they might know who tribe is. is. Yes. Okay. All right. All right. But if I would throw on Tribe or, or like De La or or someone like that, um, suddenly it felt like there was like a buoyancy to their music and I felt lighter. I felt like, oh, like the, the day was brighter. It was like, you know, <laughs> Saturday afternoon. And <laughs> Saturday, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I became real conscious of how music affects your vibration in the world at a pretty young age. And so... Later, as you're just learning how to put together characters, I started thinking, wow, this guy would not listen to the same things that I would listen to. So that's that's really how what I began to do. It's kind of one of the first things I do, because when I was doing Moonlight, I was working on three other projects. And so any given day I could be on a different set. And so going to work or being in my trailer, I would click on a different playlist to kind of let remind my body like muscle memory, like, mm -hmm. oh, you're about to step into Remy Danton's shoes. So you're on the House of Cards set. And just energetically, I would kind of remember Remy's voice or how he moves just because Remy is somebody who would respond more to a Jay-Z when Juan is not listening to Jay-Z. You know what I mean? So um, so that's really how, how music uh, affects me and how, I, how I've always related to it in terms of, of acting. Well, you're going to really enjoy this. Coming up, it's time for the impression session. Support for this podcast and the following message comes from Red Bull Radio. Whether it's the latest dancehall out of Kingston, techno from Berlin, underground hip-hop, or old soul gems, Red Bull Radio is the place to tune in and discover great music that's new to you. With in-depth interviews and live performances from festivals around the globe, 
Plus, music handpicked by influential artists, journalists, and DJs. You'll know what you're looking for when you hear it. Listen at RedBullRadio.com. And we're back with the impression session. So, Mahashala. Yes. Here's how it works. Yes. We play a track. Okay. We're not going to tell you what it is. Okay. Oh, God. Stretch is going to play one. I'm going to play one. All we want is your honest feedback, your honest impression. However the song has vibrated with you. Okay. Share that. Brand Nubians. Woo! That was Brand Nubians, Alayu Akbar. Rec time is here. <laughs> ad loops, ad loops. Let's get paid on free loops. <laughs> oh, sad- sadat. Oh, man. This is my jam. Oh, my God. This joint. Uh, my impression of this is blown away. This is, oh, that's my joint. Yeah, I love that joint. I- I'm-, I'm curious. Now, Brand new and, and you know KMD, Rakim, uh, Lakim Shabazz. There was mm. so much influence of Islam in in all of its its measures, from the Nation mm. of Islam to the Five Percenters to the Ansar Laws, yeah. to mm. Islam from Arab Muslim mm. countries, and it was being shared in hip hop. Yeah. So, what effect did it have on you? I, I just think hearing sprinkles of it in the music from, like you said, Brand Nubians, Wu Tang, KMD, you know, Chuck D, uh, all these brothers, just you know, tribe. Like hearing just brothers in some way, uh, Nas, just like saying certain things, you know, that mention Allah or or any of the prophets in some way. You felt like it was okay. Like you just felt like, oh, not only was it okay that it became your responsibility to be spiritually conscious in some way. And so I think it became something that hip hop is demonized so much, but people don't necessarily recognize that there's a real spiritual vein current that runs in hip hop and how much these young men and and women have contributed to people finding their path with their spirituality so it was hip-hop always found a way to remind you that god was present i'll just say as a white kid that got into hip-hop and the grand scale of things pretty early that aspect whether islam was being spoken about explicitly or just alluded to Mm. um opened up a window into a world that i probably Mm. would not have known about otherwise or i would have had Mm. misinformation about if it wasn't for Um, that invitation to to learn more. So yeah, yeah. We're gonna play another song. Mm. Vibing out at the club. <laughs> yeah, yeah, girl. What's happening? Oh, for real? Yeah. Come on, come on, come groove with me a little bit. Shake your hips. Come on. Yeah. Oh, now I don't drink. Just just pass me some soda water. Yeah, ooh, 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 ooh. Yeah, uh, back up. Oh, yeah, is that carbonated? Nah. Drop a cherry on top. What? Boom. Yeah, uh, bring the Jungle Brothers in. Yeah, bounce, house, what, shake, yeah, do it, do it, do it, pump, what? Throw your hands up, girl. Moonwalk, moonwalk, sway, step to the side, and dip, jump, dip. Jump. Oh yeah. Uh. What's your number, girl? No, no, seriously, it's cause like now you got me feeling terrible. Like this brother that got on here and like disrespected somebody's culture and their music, like no. so I apologize no, for the no, no. jump. The, the producer is yeah. Ashun Lade. He's a very, very beautiful dude. I think he would be delighted that, that you even listen to it. Um but uh, the reason why I played it is because I, you know, I'm aware that you had a, a little bit of spoken word experience, yeah. and uh, maybe not in the hip house. Uh, <laughs> I was just gonna say, <laughs> yes. when's your hip house yes. album coming? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. But um, mm-hmm. but I, I did want to, if you could, you know, touch upon about some of your magical memories of being on a mic, not with the mm. beat, but just mm. speaking to an audience that is hearing your view of the world. 
I, I just remember um, that feeling, which is similar to being on stage as acting, but it was my first time that I had seen somebody affected by something that I observed and what that meant, you know, like when you go to church, you know, or when you grew up in some capacity where there's a speaker at a podium and you were vibing with them. And I saw Amir Suleiman in New York about a year ago. Um, and I just remember like laughing and crying, like kind of at the same time and just, and what that could do to you. And so being in the audience and being moved by something that somebody says and thinking about something different and it leaving an impression on you is, is something that is, that is stuck with me about that time. My brother. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Indeed. Indeed. Knowing that you have a seed back home with your wife. Who's newborn. You might have heard her crying in the hallway. She's back there in the, in the hallway, kind of like, hurry up, <laughs> hurry up. <laughs> Well, that's a blessing. Spend some time with her and, and yeah, enjoy the rest of your yeah. day. Much love. I really, really hope that hey, me and Stretch can, much love. can cross paths with you Indeed. at some point yeah. on the dance floor, yeah. on the ball court. Same you here. You know, on a stage. Whatever. Yeah, it's got to be some hip house, though. Like, I was just going to say. I was going to say. Let's hip do a hip house, house album. Thank you, brothers. I appreciate y'all. I, I appreciate just so much of what you guys have just contributed to the culture and, and what you're still doing. And it's it's special work, man. And it, it's impacted my life. Like, I really sincerely mean that. So thank you so much. Wow, Word thank up. you. Really appreciate that. Yeah. Peace. All right. All right, brothers. Peace. Later. That's our show. This podcast was produced by Sammy Ennigan, edited by Steve Nelson and Nigel Eaton. And, of course, executive produced by the one and only Abby O'Neill. Special thanks to our VP of Programming, Anya Grunman. This episode features original music by DJ Ellie Escobar. If you like the show, you can hear more at npr.org. Or wherever you like to listen. Peace!